Hello everyone, can uh, everyone can hear me? Uh, you can go ahead and uh, reply in the chat if you can hear me. It's been a while since I did this YouTube live stream, so I'm still trying to get used to, to all the things. But let me know if you can hear me. Let me go ahead and type. Let me double check it. Testing, yeah, so you should be loud and clear. Okay, thank you so much. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, and if you have any questions, you can write it down on the chat. Uh, there is a delay, I think, when you hear my message, my sound. I think there is a little bit of a delay, meaning um, you will get to that point probably, you know, in a couple of seconds, like maybe five or eight seconds delay. But if you had any question, you can definitely type it out. Okay, so you can see my screen and everything. So today we'll be discussing Surf UI architecture, building client-server application. For the server, I will be using, uh, I think it's already there. It's called the fake store API. Let me actually move it into a different screen. All right. And for those of you who don't, don't know me, my name is Mohammad Azam. Uh, I have a website called azamsharp.com. Um, I work as a bootcamp instructor where I teach, but I also do iOS projects on the side. And uh, on my website, you can see all of my courses. So these are all the courses on Udemy. And I sometimes I write articles. I take a lot of time to, to write articles. Uh, most of the articles are actually kind of long. You can see this is a new article that I just published, which is about testing and pragmatic testing. So definitely read all of these things out if you if you get a chance. Okay. So this is the API that we'll be using, which is the fake store API. Um, all that stuff over here is fake. And right now we're just gonna cover enough so that we can display all the categories um, and probably also add a new category. So all of these things will be in the actual API. I can share the link that's on the chat. You can check it out. And it's a pretty pretty decent API that you can use. Uh, all the stuff is obviously fake. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. And um, I think someone has Someone has the uh, microphone or speaker uh, speaker set up, I guess. Oh wait, no. What am I going on? Oh, why am I doing this over here? What is that? I don't think I need that. Okay, sorry. No, forget about that. Uh, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> I'm still getting used to these this thing. I think I was I was listening to my own recording. I don't know why this that is coming up. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new Swift project. I'll call it Store App. I'll just put it on the desktop. That's fine. And can everyone see the font? Do you want me to increase the font size or something, or is that okay? I think right now the font size is 20. So go ahead and write out on the uh, chat if you can if you can uh, see the font and everything is okay. I'll be drinking coffee. Okay, let me increase a little bit more. There we go. Font is okay. All right. Okay. So this is our application right now. I mean, it's a boilerplate, there's no code has been written. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead a bit larger. Okay, there we go. I think now it's like 24 or something, 24, okay. So what I want to do is I want to fetch obviously the data 
which we lost again. Uh, this one. Not sure what's going on with my settings over here. There we go. So we want to fetch all this information and display it on the screen. I think that's as high as I can go without, that's like 26 now, okay? So how can I how can I do that? Meaning how can I fetch the information and display it on the screen? Now there are many different ways of doing that. Um, I can actually create a function and that's what they do in React. They usually create a function right over here and perform the fetch. And now I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, it will work, but I don't think that's a good idea to do that. All right, so what I will do is I will create services and inside the services, I'm going to add a new file called <clears throat> web service. There we go. And now I can create a web service. This is also considered like an HTTP client if you want to say that, that's fine. Uh, I'm just gonna, going to call this uh, a service. And in this, I'm going to go ahead and create a function called get categories. Because that is what we are trying to do. We are trying to get all the categories. And it is going to give us a category model, which by the way, we don't have. So we will have to create that also. And now we will just type in some code to fetch all the categories. Now I'm going to type in over here the URL and I'm going to type over the URL that we will fix it in the later video. And the reason is that right now we're just using the one URL. Probably if you are working in an environment like an enterprise environment, you will have to have different URLs uh, for testing, for QA, for you know quality assurance, for development, for production. And right now we have a hard coded the URL for ease of use, but we will fix that later in some other video. Right now our main purpose is just to get all the data and display it on the screen and that's it. We also don't really have so which architecture I'm using? I use the architecture called MV pattern, MV pattern. Uh, and if you want to know a little bit more about it, I have a very detailed article. Now, I'm not saying that you should use MV pattern or you should not use MV pattern. If you are comfortable with uh, MVVM, you can use that. If you are using, uh, if you're using TCA, you can use that, you know, whatever architecture you're using. I'm just gonna use this because I find it very simple, okay? Once again, we're gonna fix that. So don't complain over here. We're gonna fix that later in some other video. Right now, we just want to get the data. The other thing is that we don't even have the category like this thing. So that's not gonna work. So let's go ahead and create a new group. We'll call it models. I'm gonna add a new file. I will say this is a category because that's what we are trying to do. And category will be a struct. And it will be a decodable. And probably I think we will have to display it on the screen so we'll make it identifiable also. It will have a couple of different properties like ID, which will be an integer. It will have a couple of different properties like ID, which will be an integer and I think it has a name and the image. And all of these properties are coming from the JSON. So if you look at the JSON over here, uh, so if you look at the JSON over here, I know it's kind of like small, but I can zoom in. This is what we are going to get for the category, right? The category will have an ID, a name and image. And that is exactly the, the mapping that I'm doing over here. I have an ID name and image, exactly matching. If it's not matching, then you can use coding keys, but you know, I'm just gonna match it exactly as it is. Okay, so we have the category struct, which represents a particular category. I can go again back to my web service. We'll fix that later. As I said, I know somebody's gonna complain, hey, you can't do that, we'll fix that later. Don't worry about it right now. Okay, then what should we do? We should probably use the URL session dot shared dot data for URL, we already have the URL. We can just pass in that. Since we're using the async and await function of the URL session, 
um, we can actually use try await over here and we will get some sort of a tuple back which will have a data and the response. All right, so we'll get those things back and now we can check the response. So if the response is coming out to be good, then we can do something about it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and convert the response into HTTP URL response because that will have a status code property. And I'm gonna check also that if the status that I have received is actually 200. Else, if it's not, then throw an exception. So right now we don't have any exception, but we will like to throw an exception if something went bad. This means that I will probably go ahead and create a new exception, invalid server response, and throw that exception. Network error dot invalid server response. Great. All right. Okay. Once we go past the HTTP response and hopefully everything is good, then it is time for us to get the data. So I can go ahead and get the data. I can move it into categories and I can decode it. JSON decoder dot decode category dot self because it's an array. And this is how we will decode it. Else, if it's a problem decoding, then we can throw the decoding error. And again, there is no decoding error, so we'll have to add it over here. If everything is fine, then we will go ahead and return categories. All right, so that's it. That is our initial version of our web service. There's only one function inside the web service right now, which is get categories. And all it does is that it goes to the server, into this URL, which we will eventually change in some later video, and it gets all the stuff and it returns all the categories. And that's it. So the decoding part is gonna decode whatever the JSON is coming from the server, which may look like this an array of categories, and we might have like eight or 10 different categories, and it's going to decode it and going to send it back, okay? So this is our function. Now, if you want, you can call this right from the actual view. I usually don't do that, but I can show it to you that it can be done, and you can do those things. So let me go over there, and we will remove that code, so don't worry about it, but what I'm gonna do over here is simply going to go ahead and create what about the errors? Yeah, error handling will be handled on the client side, right right over here. Now in this particular case, we might not uh, go all the way and display the errors, but that will be covered in the later video. But let me show you one other way that you can do that. And we are not going to do this way, but I just want to show you that you can do that if you want to. So in the content view, and don't do that, we will, I'll actually write it down over here. We will remove this code and use aggregate model instead. So I'm just gonna write it out over here so that I know that someone will complain that, hey, you can do that. Well, you can, if you want to, you can, but I'll tell you that why probably you shouldn't. Okay, categories, category. So what I'm doing is I'm creating this local state called categories, which is an array of, well, empty array, there's nothing in there. And I also created the web service instance right inside my content view. Now, even though I have a web service instance, I still want to make the call and get all the data. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, do a list, categories, and we will get a category. We'll remove this code. I'm just showing you that this can be done this way also. And then we're gonna talk about what issues you can face in this scenario, okay? And for the task, we can go ahead and perform. This is where you will actually do your error handling. So if I try to call web get categories, I cannot really call it correctly because it's, uh, you know, it's a function that is async and it can throw and this is where I can go ahead and call it, cache the error. And right now, I'm just gonna display the error over here, but we will look 
at the errors and displaying errors in later video, all right? And this is going to return us something, I guess, which we can assign to categories. And now you can see that your categories are actually being printed out. Now, even though you can do this and we can see it working, one of the main problems that you may see with this approach is sometimes, and not in this scenario, but there will be some scenario where you're like, well, I need to sort, I need to filter, I need to do this and that. I need to do all of those things. And the web service is not really capable of handling the, the state. It's not really uh, ho like holding on to the array of categories, right? Now, categories local state is definitely handling it out and we can use the view to perform all the filter, but sometimes we want to share the view. Sometimes we want to say that, well, we will be able to add a new category and then it becomes a little bit more difficult to maintain that. So even though you can do this and there is nothing wrong with this, uh, you can do that. Doesn't this call to be called every time the view is rendered? Yeah, that's fine. Every time the view is rendered, we call this uh, and that should be fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you never know what kind of categories got added on the server side. Now, if you don't want to do that, then we are talking about caching. Right, So you would like to add a caching layer, which is going to fetch all the data from the server, cache it locally, even do micro caching. Micro caching simply means that you're going to only cache it for a small period of time, like five or six seconds, and that will also improve performance, okay? So caching will be your answer that uh, for if you don't want to call it again and again. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at a different approach. Now, I don't really use this particular approach when I'm building the app. I don't really like to create an instance inside the content view. So I like a little bit more separation. So what I usually do is I add a new model and I will call it store model. Now, what is this store model that we are adding? Well, this store model is what I like to call an aggregate model. You can call it a facade, you can call it whatever you want. The main idea of the store model is that this is going to be the place where your view is going to interact. The store model will be responsible for providing you with all the data that you need. So the store model will have a published property for, what is it, categories, category, and the store model will have functions like populate categories. Populate categories, async throws. So it's kind of like a, right now it's gonna serve as a pass through function, which means that it's not really going to do much, but what you can do is if you want to filter out, if you do want to put the store model in the environment object, so all of those things you can definitely accomplish. All right, let's go ahead and create a web service over here. Now at this point, some of you might be thinking that shouldn't the store model take web service as kindly increased font for the entire laptop, we can't see the file names clearly. Well, um, I think I did it for all of it. I don't know why this file names are not increasing, but I'll give you the code, you can check a look at that. All right. Now. Sometimes what people do is they create the store model or whatever, the view model, and then they pass the web service as a dependency. And one of the reasons that they do that is so that they will say, oh, well, so that I can pass a mock to it. That's not a good approach at all. And the reason it's not a good approach is that now your whole architecture is based around that you can test it out. And testing is good, but testing out your view models, testing out these kind of things, they don't really make any sense. I don't really have a view model, but I have this store model. If I want to test out my store model, then I can simply write an end-to-end -end test. So I don't really have to, if I'm using MVVM, which I'm not, but if I was using MVVM, there's no, uh, no reason to write your test 
which are based on mocks because the mocks are mocking a managed dependency, meaning a dependency that you can perhaps control. All right, so don't do that. Now I can say web service dot get categories. And I believe I will just do something like that. It's going to return a something which we can assign it to the categories. And I want to assign it on the main, meaning on the main one, uh, main uh, thread. So I'm just decorating it with the main actor. All right. So this is a store model. This has a function called populate categories. It calls the web service. Web service returns you something that is assigned to the categories. Categories is marked with published. This means that the categories will be uh, updated. And also it's gonna tell your view that, hey, something got updated and uh, you should probably go ahead and refresh yourself. The web service over here, you can see that it's kind of like just creating an instance of a concrete web service. So I'm not gonna create a protocol just for the sake of creating a protocol. It's no use. And I'm not gonna create a protocol so that I can mock it out. There's no need to pass mocks into this. You can simply write end-to-end -end test and test out your UI instead of mocking that, oh, something got triggered on the view model and something got incremented. Those tests are not really you know, worth it. They don't really provide you the return on your investment. If you do want to read more about it, I actually did publish a very detailed article. I'll link it over here. Uh, actually, that's my latest article, unit testing, uh, about testing. So definitely read that out. I, it took a long time to write that article, so definitely read this out, okay? All right. So now we can go back to our content view and try to replace the web service. Instead of the web service, we can actually create a state object for now. Private var model store model. Okay, so now we're gonna be using store model instead. And over here we are, we don't really need categories I think in, in this case because the store model does have a categories, uh, you know, collection. And we don't need that. We will simply go ahead and say model dot populate categories. Why do we need to update it on the main actor? Why, where is it? Uh, so main actor basically means that we are making sure that all the properties uh, and the functions on the store model are updated on the main actor. And the reason that we are doing it on the main actor on the main is because the published property, if you try to set it in the background thread, which we may or may not be, uh, it's going to complain and it's going to cause issues. So that's the main reason since it is marked with publish, these kind of properties that are marked with publish should always be set on the main thread, all right? Okay, so we got the web service, we got everything. Let's go ahead and see if it actually loads or not. And it works, you can see it's actually loading correctly. All the categories are loaded, so that looks fine. Now we can go ahead and add some other stuff to it. I believe we are also getting the image so let's see if we can add the image. So I'm just gonna say at stack, and I believe it's called async image, which allows us to display the image. So category dot image, we will get the image. And state object and state, uh, state is just for local things, meaning if you want to put something local. Uh, what is that store model is not a view model except for the name of course. No, so that's where it's a, it's a very different. So store model is not a view model, it's an, a model. And the reason is that the difference between a view model and a store model is in a view model approach, you will create a view model for pretty much every screen. I mean, if I was building this and I was displaying categories, I would call it category list view model, right? And then there will be another view model called category view model, which will represent each item. If I'm building a screen call adding a category or add category view, then it will be add category view model. If I'm building a login view model, it will be login view model. 
registration screen, register, registration view model. But you don't really need view model per se because all the binding features are available right there in your view. So you don't really need that stuff. I mean, in some cases you may need it, but in most cases you don't really need those things. All right. So that is a, that's a good question. And I think that's where people usually get like, okay, it, isn't it like a different name? It's not a different name. It will end up with a lot uh, less uh, code that you will have to type. Uh, let me go to the category. I think I call category image as a string. I'm just gonna call it URL, which can be decoded correctly. That's fine. And hopefully now it should be okay. And now I can say image dot resizable dot, let's go ahead and set some frame. Frame is 100, height is 100. You can adjust this as much as you want. Let's go ahead and see if it actually displays something. Okay, loading image. And we can even clip shape to be, let's say, rounded rectangle with a corner radius 10.0 and with uh, continuous. So it will be a little bit rounded rectangle. All right, so we got the image to be displayed. You can see all these images are like all, like all random, I guess. And we got the name to be displayed. All right. Any other questions at this point? So with very less code, I guess, we are able to you know, display all the images. We are able to display, uh, you know, all uh, all the categories that are currently available. Now, obviously it does not have a caching features and all those, this, so that's a little bit more, like maybe in the future we can cover those things. We also need to find out a way to display the errors. We also eventually have to find out a way to create these URLs. We shouldn't be hard coding URLs over here like this. And maybe eventually we'll see that the web service has functions like get categories, get product by categories, uh, get this, get that. We will en eventually end up creating some sort of a generic web service, which will work uh, and not like, which will contain like 30 different functions. But step by step, we don't have to jump it, jump on it right now, all right? Okay, so we got this working, that's great. The other thing that I want to do, I want to see if we can do this, is adding a navigation stack. And you haven't explained different between state and state object. Um, I would say, you know, a state is private, which means as state, which we use. I don't think we are using state, state. So state is kind of like a private state, local state for that particular view. Um, and it's for values that are, I would say, mostly something going on on the screen. Now, I know that we can place like array of something in there, but state is usually private and it doesn't really affect anything else, uh, just that particular view. The state object, usually you use state object when you are fetching information from a third party or getting the resource from a third party, which may or may not take some time. And that's the main reason that uh, when we get the information, we can use the published properties to assign it and then to update it. All right, so that's the main difference. Um, sometimes you'll see that we can use state, sometimes we can use state object. Uh, I usually end up using environment object, as you will see in this also. Uh, I don't like to pass values too much, so I can just use environment object if I want to. Okay, so we got the navigation stack. I don't think we're gonna do anything with the navigation. Uh, let's go ahead and add a navigation title. I will call it categories. I think you can use a navigation view also over here. I don't think we're gonna do, at least not right now. We're not really doing any navigation. And other things we can add is perhaps we can add a toolbar. So now we are moving towards how can we go ahead and add a new category, okay? So let's go ahead and see what toolbars is available. Uh, we have toolbar and a tab, not tab, sorry, toolbar item. And the placement will be trailing. 
and the button will be add a category. And every time you change the state, which is a local state, um, what happens is the view gets re-evaluated, not re-rendered. So that's one of the misconceptions we have in the, the iOS community. We don't re-render the view, we only re-evaluate the view. And then if SwiftUI decides that, oh, you are actually using in, you have 30 controls over here. Well, we can have 30, but you have like 10 controls over here, 10 different views over here, and only one of them is using the state value, then only that control will get re-rendered and not anything else. So I guess in this particular case, the list is the one that is consuming the categories. So the list will be the one that will, well, that will be re-rendered whenever I get the categories, okay? Okay, so we got the add category button, which is right there, great. So add category, what we want to do is we want to open up a new something, like a new page, which will allow us to add the categories. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add a new group and add a new surf file. And we will call it add category view. So that view will be responsible for simply adding a new category. I believe the category consists of, and <clears throat> that is where you go to the documentation. So in order to create a new category, we need to pass in the name of the category, and this can be anything, and the image of the category. With this can be any image, any valid image is fine, okay? Okay, so how do we create that particular form? Well. Let's go ahead and create the form. So I'll use the form element. And I don't really have to create a view model. I mean, all of this stuff is available in the view. So why create a separate view model for add category view model? It's not really going to give me anything. So if I have 30 different fields, I'm uh, creating like a driver license, somebody's applying for a driver license and it has to fill out 15 different fields, and yeah, maybe I'll think about creating a view model so I don't have to write these lines again and again. But right now, it's fine. I don't have to create a view model for this. Okay, so first is I believe the, uh, and the second one is the image URL. Okay, and now I can go ahead and say text field, enter name, and the binding, which will be the name. Another text field, enter URL, I guess image URL, that's what we're entering. And this will go into the image URL. See, all of these things are available in the view. So we didn't really have to create a separate view model to do all of those things. The view itself is capable of providing you binding. Unlike WPF, Windows Presentation Foundation, where you have to create a XAML file and then you have to create a view model and then you have to like talk between them. Uh, Swift UI, just like I guess React state, which is use state and use state uh, wrappers, uh, they have the complete capability. Okay, so we have the form and we only have two fields, I guess the name and the uh, image URL. How are we going to add that? Well, let's go ahead and see if I can add a navigation view over here. That's a normal navigation view not a stack. And let's see if we can add a navigation title. Let's say add, and what are we adding? We're adding a category. The other thing that I want to do over here is probably add like a toolbar or something. So let's say that if I can add a toolbar, which will be toolbar, and the reason I'm adding a toolbar, I want to add like a button or something, all right? So let's go ahead and add a toolbar, um, trailing, and the button will be save. We're trying to save the category. Now we need to do some validation. We can't really allow the user to save a particular category uh, like an empty one. So you have to enter the name and you have to enter the image URL. Both of them have to be entered. This is not a business rule. 
All right, so this is a very important point that you must understand over here. The validation of the user interface, the validation of the form is not a business rule. It's not domain logic. It's just a UI validation and that's nothing more and nothing less. This is no different than writing input type text. Anybody does the HTML over here? There's no different than this. It's the same thing. What does that do? Well, it validates that the input field that you have on the HTML, you better put something in there or else probably the form will not be submitted. Okay? So it's the same thing. It's UI validation. Don't confuse UI validation with business rules. In a client server application, which we are building, if there are any business rules, which I don't see any, those will be on the server. And I don't own the server. Server is by some other person. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and create a property over here. Is form valid? Which will be returning Boolean. And now we can simply validate this. If name is empty, well, if it's not empty, and if image URL is empty, it's not empty, then we can do something. You can add more validation. Um, you can add validation that if the image URL is in the correct, like the correct format, like I can enter one ABC and that shouldn't be correct. So you can add those validation yourself. Uh, it will be fairly easy to do that, all right? So this is it. If the name is not empty and if the image URL is not empty, well, then your form is valid. Now also add over here, add a check for format of image URL. That is for you, you can add that, all right? Just use some regex and you can do those things. Based on that, we can disable. So if the form is valid, if it's not valid, then it's disabled. And you can see now the form is actually disabled. So that's one way of validating one way, not even validating, validating the UI, I guess, that the form save button will only be available, will only be enabled uh, when you have, uh, you know, when you have checked everything, that the name is not empty and the image URL is not empty and add a check to check if the image URL is in the correct format, that's for you, that's your homework, you can do that. But uh, right now we're just checking that if the form is valid based on a couple of different things. Uh, by the way, any questions? I know that's I'm going uh, too fast, too slow. If you have any question, go ahead and write it out on the chat. All right. So what about if it's everything is valid? So everything is valid, meaning the save button is now clickable. And this is where we should be able to add a particular category. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and create a function over here private function save category and this will be an async function and I don't know if it will actually throw or not but we can definitely check that one out uh, if it throws okay uh, let's just not throws just like this and now we can go ahead and call that function save category okay now the task modifier over here, I'm using it because uh, I need to call the save category function. Uh, you don't really have to create a function if you don't want to. I mean, you can just call the model.save or whatever, and that's fine too. I'm just making it, I guess, a little bit more clear. And the task modifier over here is saying that we are in a, a non-async context. So go ahead and create the context for async. And in that, now I can call save category and uh, you know, await for it. So what should we do inside over there? Well, this is where we will need access to the actual, yeah, that's what I said. Why not call the store model directly? That's definitely, you can do that. Absolutely, you can do that. So I'm just making it a little bit clear so that people will understand that safe category does all of that stuff. But as I mentioned earlier, you can, uh, you can actually call the model directly, okay? Okay, so we will need access to the model. That's the first thing. And we will also need a web service to be able to add or save a category. So currently our web service does not have any function 
that can save a category. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a save category where you will pass in a category. And when you when it saves it, it actually does return you the saved category. Okay. Again, we need a URL to save the category. I'll go back to the documentation. Copy this URL. Not a good idea to use these URLs like this. We will have to build some sort of a system. So our URLs will be much nicer and not hard coded because now it will always communicate with this URL. Uh, probably in your enterprise application, you want to change it to sometimes use the development environment, sometimes use a different environment, and so on. Let's go ahead and create a request, URL request. We can pass in the URL, request.http method, request.body, that's the important part, HTTP body. And in the body, we will have to encode it encode category. Now we can't really encode it because the category is only conforming to decodable. So in this case, we will go ahead and say codable, which is basically a protocol, which is a combination of uh, encodable and decodable. So now it should be able to do both. And let's go ahead and fix this error. There we go. And this save category will be an async function, which can also throw, so we'll make it throwable. We will also go ahead and say the header, which will be application uh, JSON, because we are sending JSON in the end. And this will be the content type. So we're checking, we're telling the server that, hey, we will be performing a post request. The body contains the, the actual, uh, the thing that we want to insert. And we will also have the header set to content type property or content type key as a value application JSON. The other thing that we want to do is we want to go ahead and perform this request. So, well, not this one, I guess we have to use the request one now. So shared dot uh, for request, we can pass in the request and try await data and response. So after that, we get to the same thing, okay? Again, we're gonna check the response and you can see that this is where you will have to stop and, well, not stop, but this is where you have to keep in mind that, hey, I just kind of like use this approach over here also, but for uh, adding a new category, I believe the response time will be 201 or the response code will be 201. So that is something that you will have to take care of and we kind of like copy pasted the code from here to here. Um, at this point, you should probably write down that it will be a good idea to refactor your web service into some sort of a more generic format so that you don't have to create several different functions for saving a category, getting the category, getting the product, saving the product, all of that stuff. But right now it's not really, we are not there yet, okay? And now we can go ahead and decode the response. So the response itself, they are actually going to send us the category, the one that we just saved it. So we will hopefully get that back. And uh, I guess we can move it or we can just return it like this. Well, I guess we can, uh, we can use a different approach. Plot category. And if there's a problem, then that means this will be kind of like a decoding error. We can simply go ahead and say network error dot decoding error. And then in the end, we can return it. Okay, there we go. So this will be our first draft of the save category function, which is going to save a category. Now we haven't really tested this out. We haven't really called this function. So let's go ahead and try to call this function. I'll go to my store model. You see store model, you can see that it's different from a view model approach. In a normal small application and sometimes even medium sized application, you only need one store model. 
and that's it. If you are building much larger applications where you have uh, e-commerce application, where you have inventory fulfillment, you have catalog, you have other stuff, then don't call it store model in those cases, but then you will call this based on the bounded context of, where, of the domain. So in a e-commerce application, your domain models can be catalog, inventory, fulfillment, uh, payment, uh, cart, all of those can be can become their own aggregate models that will give you access to much smaller models or domain specific models. I'm going to go ahead and create a function called save category where you have to pass in the categories. Right now, these are all pass through functions. They're not really going to do much as you can see. Async throws and uh, web service dot save category. We're going to pass in the category. We are going to get back a category once we call it, right? So we're going to get back the category and try await. Okay, so what do we do when we get back a category? Well, instead of making a call again to the server and getting all the categories in the dismiss of the modal, which we will display, uh, we can simply go ahead and take these categories and append it to our existing collection. There we go. So this is going to save us a round trip to the server if we want to go and say that, oh, fetch the categories again or something. After adding a new category, we are simply going to add the category inside the categories array, uh, which is maintained by this store model observable object. And that is gonna cause a re-evaluation of the view as well as re-rendering of the list. Now, if we go back to the add category view, we still haven't really called that, right? And this is where we have to think about, well, how would we get access to the model? If I go ahead and create a state object over here, which I also did in the last one, I can go ahead and create a model, store model. Now, this is a brand new store model, which uh, may not have the same collection of uh, the categories. It will be empty because it's, we just created it as a brand new one. Don't we only want to do it if the service succeeds saving? Well, service actually did succeed saving. So if it didn't succeed saving, then it will throw an error. If you want to go a little, yeah, so it actually, if there was a problem, uh, then you can see that it will fire the decoding error. If there was another problem, it will fire invalid response. So the response that the server is gonna send will not be 201, if it didn't succeed saving. So that response you're only going to get when you are succeed saving. Uh, so this check, you can say that it's kind of like extra for decoding. Maybe they changed something and now they're returning you uh, ID, but they're not calling it ID, they're calling it uh, category ID. So in those cases, it will fail over here, which is fine. No, this means that decoding error has happened. So, how do we make sure this? Now, this is where I always kind of go back to the environment object because we already created the store model which already fetched the information and populated it. But that store model that we created was always inside the content view. So I have two different options over here. If I am presenting a add category view, let's actually first go do that then I can pass this model or the categories to that add category view so that I have single source of truth. But the first thing is that we need to make sure that we can even display the add category view because right now it's not working, right? So I will go ahead and create an add category. What I'm going to do is I'm just gonna set these presented to be true. And somewhere over here, we can add a sheet which will be based on its presented value and it will present you add category view. Let's see if that works, okay? Okay, there we go, it actually works. And if I type in something into the add category, you can see that the save button, I can't really click on it because it's disabled, 
Uh, but if I start typing in the URL, then it works. Now, again, the URL, we're not checking for the regex expression that it's in the correct format. That's your homework, you can do that. So definitely it will be a good idea to do that, all right? And I can dismiss this. Okay, so we can pass in, we can do that at category view, but the problem is that the content view was responsible for creating the model and it is holding on to these categories. So either I go ahead and pass in these categories <clears throat> to the category view model, or I can pass in the whole thing over there. That's also possible. But in those cases, I usually revert back to, instead of using the state object, I try to use the environment object. Also good to make sure, 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 you can do that. So those are your homework problems. You can, you can solve those things. Uh, I'm just gonna make it environment object and make sure that you inject in the preview also in, in, in your actual app. So store model, there we go. Okay, so what exactly is environment object? So environment object basically means that this particular object will be available to all the views that are child of content view. Well, that's because we are injecting in the content view. So this means this particular model or whatever you're injecting into the environment object, it will be available to the content view and all the children's of the content view. Now in our case, the content view is the root view. Now, so it will be available to the content view and all the children of the content view, which is everything, all right? So let's go ahead and see how we can make this work. Uh, make sure that we go over here in your app file and also inject the environment object because the one that we injected into our content view right at the bottom, this is just for the previews. If you don't do this, if you don't do this part, your previews are going to break. Preview means this one on the right hand side, it's gonna break. So just to satisfy that, we're just gonna inject the store model into the environment object. And for your actual application, you have to make sure that you inject it over here, okay? Okay, let's go back to our code. There we go. So now the store model is inside the environment object. It's already initialized because that is what we passed in, which is right here in the preview. And or in your actual app, it's right there. We're creating an instance and passing it. So it already initialized, it's kind of like a global state uh, but not global in the sense that everyone has access to it, but it's global in the sense that the view in which you injected has access to it and all the views that are children of that view have access to it, all right? So not like all of a sudden the whole app has access to it, all right? Okay, so now we can go back to the add category view. And in the add category view, we can use the same environment object. So we can use the same global state. So this means that the content view, which is listing all the categories and the add category view, they're both looking at the same picture. They're both looking at the same source of truth. And now I can go ahead and add this. So we're actually using the stores as stores as part of the environment. Stores, I don't know what you mean by stores. We, yes, we are injecting the store model into the environment, yes. Environment object, okay? A store model, as you can see, it's, I like to call it an aggregate model. It's basically one model for a small app, even a medium-sized app, you can get away with just creating one model that kind of directs the flow of everything that's going on. Um, so instead of creating like, you know, a category list view model, add category view model, we just have a store model. We just have one model for now. If we need it, we can create more, but right now we don't really need it. Okay, so save category. What should we do at this point? I guess we have to use the model. 
dot save category and we have to pass in the category. So let's go ahead and create a category. And you can do that over here also in the, in the button click, that's fine too. Okay, so we are going to create a category. Now, we don't really have a category ID at this point because we are creating a new, we are creating a new category. And if we are creating a new category, we don't have the category ID, it's not available right now that will be created on the server. So I have to go back to the category and I have to change this to var because it will be eventually be set, but not right now. And also nullable, which means that when we're creating a new category on the client side uh, and the category does not really exist on the server side, it uh, will be created eventually. Okay, so let's go back. So we don't really need to pass in the ID because we don't have it and we'll pass in the name and we'll pass in the image URL. So at least that will allow us to create the category. Uh, what's going on over here? Oh, so image, yeah, again, probably you will, it will be a much better idea. So we'll say image URL equals to URL string, and then I guess we can pass in image URL. Uh, you can throw some error over here or whatever, use something over here to display that the error message, you know, something is going wrong, okay? Now, if you did, which we didn't, but if you did validate the image URL, that it is in the correct format, then you can kind of like force unwrapping it if you want. Okay, so image URL, there we go. And now we can go ahead and save it. So save category and pass in the category. I believe this is a await function, and I also think that this is a try function. So now we have to take care of all these errors. If there are any errors thrown, we have to take care of it. Eventually we'll display the error. Right now we will not. Display error on UI later. Uh, I do have a course on Combine, but if you want to learn more about this technique, I'll share the course with you. Um, but yeah, I do have a course on Combine. I'm not using a, any Combine over here. There's no need to, but yes, I do have a course on Combine. Okay, so I think this looks promising. Um, after the person has added a particular category, we probably want to dismiss. So I'm just gonna use environment. And this is environment, not the environment object. Environment is basically just some sort of a preferences. It comes with different keys. You can create your own, uh, but these are already available, which Apple or CIFUI team has added. There are a couple of more. I mean, actually there are more, 15 or 20 more, but the dismiss is the one that is going to allow us to dismiss the actual, um, you know, the actual sheet that was displayed, okay? Let's go ahead and build it. Uh, I think that should be it, right? I mean, I think we are saving the category and hopefully it will save the category and display it. Uh, let's go ahead and run our application. Uh, let me go ahead and actually run it in the actual simulator and see if it works. Okay. I mean, you can run it in the Xcode previews also, but we're just trying to see is it important to learn Combine? Um, it's up to you. I guess if you want to learn Combine, that's fine for some reactive kind of a projects, it will be helpful. Um, yeah, I think it's a very different kind of projects which can be done with Combine and RX Swift. Uh, this project, obviously what we're building, it doesn't really need any Combine. Okay, so there we go. We have our list, that's fine. Let's go ahead and add a category and I would like to call it category 450. Can't we use URL session? Yeah, we are using URL session. So I don't know what that means. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. And save it. Okay, so hopefully it's saved. Oh, there we go. See that? Category 450 just got added. Now, if you wanted to filter it uh, based on the ID that was assigned to it, 
a good place to filter it would be your aggregate model, which is called the store model. We're not going to filter it or sort it, uh, but that will be a good place to do that. All right. So this is how I would create these kind of apps. Um, obviously, it's uh, missing a lot of stuff right now, but we can you can see that not a lot of code was required to build this kind of a setup. And this is our initial version. So it obviously does not really have any generic network layer. It doesn't have a lot of stuff, okay? Doesn't saving the new category locally kind of breaks a single source of truth, which might be on the server? No, actually it doesn't. So because we are only saving it locally when the server is doing it correctly, when the server is actually saving the category correctly, if you see over here in the code, when we get the category back, that's the step number one, and step number two is to save it. The other idea or the other thing you can do, which I don't recommend, is once you save a category, fetch all the categories again. Now, depending on how many categories you have, that might, like if you have like 100 categories and they have a lot of data, that's just another, you know, attempt that another server uh, network call that you're trying to make, which is going to be not good, all right? So in order to, when you save the category, we simply update our local copy also that the category has been saved, all right? And the single source of truth in this case is the store model, not the server. The server is providing us the data and that's what we are putting it in the store model. Store model is responsible for making sure that everybody uses the store model to get the stuff that they need. All right. Now, if I want to do any filter and everything, I would probably create another function over here for sorting and filtering and all that in the store model, and that will work too. Now, if you're a big app, if you're working on a large application, like an e-commerce store, one store model is not gonna fit in. I mean, this will become very, very, very large, thousands of lines of code. So at that point, you will have to think about stuff. At that point, you'll say, well, I have one store model, which is for one model, uh, aggregate model, which is for inventory. So it will add an inventory, it will uh, delete an inventory, it will fulfill the inventory. Then I have maybe another one uh, for catalog. So these will become all aggregate models. Uh, saving the category, if a uh, good store model be an actor, I think it can be an actor, yeah. I mean, it's already a main actor, but you can make it an actor also if you want. You can try that out. How to deal with a unique category name type constraint if someone else has saved a category with the same name that is the, the uh, that is a job for uniqueness is a job for the server, not for the client. So that will be considered a business logic and that will exist on the server. The server will be responsible for making sure that you can create a category with unique names. And right now the server may or may not do that. I have no idea. I mean, you can create a category with new category with the same name. So this means the server is currently not validating. This is not my server, so I can't really change it. But if I had the opportunity to change it, this is where I will go and this is where I will change it. What's the response of save API call? Okay, so the save API call, and uh, let me actually show you over here. One other thing that will be really useful is always to use some sort of a networking tool to find out what response you are getting. Extremely, extremely important, okay? I use Postman, but you can use anything you want. So let me use Postman over here in front of you to make a call to add a new category, and let's check out the response. So I'm gonna get the URL, which I believe is this one. So when I'm building something which uh, I would always use Postman to first check out what the server is returning. I'll send out the content type. Now you don't have to use Postman, you can use anything you want. Uh, Postman is just one of the tools. And the body that we're gonna be sending, name, 
let's call it category 900. Always use Postman or some sort of a networking tool, okay? Always. Because there is a very good chance that your server is not responding in a way that it does or it may need some additional information. So there we go. So we have the URL for post, we have the name, and let's go ahead and send it. And what we get back is the category. That's what we get back. That's the response. Okay, so the server, which is not created by me, is returning you a response, which is a, which is basically a category with the ID. So the only thing that changed is the ID, okay? And that is pretty much it. So this is how I usually design my apps. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that you should design it this way. I mean, only if you like it. I would say definitely play around with it, play around with different kind of uh, patterns and frameworks uh, and uh, design your app different way and see which one works for you, okay? Uh, I can do the same app with using, not using the environment object, but I can use the state object, but then I have to pass it around. I have to pass it to the add category view, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to pass it around for that. Now, one of the questions that people usually ask at this point is that since I don't really have any view models, how exactly are you going to test this application, right? I mean, how exactly you're going to test this that I have clicked a button and it incremented a value on the screen? Well, for first of all, if you're writing these kind of tests, which are testing the actual view model, which is uh, displaying something on the screen, that is a wrong test to write because eventually what you will do, and this is the article, again, I'm gonna link this because you should definitely read this. Eventually what you will do in your MVVM, eventually, I know that you're gonna do it, you are going to pass in a mock, right? You are going to pass in a mock to, if this is your view model that you're creating, if this is your view model, I know what you're gonna do eventually. You are going to have, and this is obviously not going to work because I don't really have those things. Uh, you will call it web service, service protocol, I believe. Uh, not like this. So this is what it will become, and eventually you're going to be mocking it, which is a bad idea. Because when you're mocking it, and you are testing or verifying your mocks in your test, it's saying that you're verifying the implementation and not the actual behavior of the app. I have explained that in a very detailed article over here, test de behavior, not implementation. And that's the same example I'm giving you. I think somewhere down the road it comes, let's see actually, uh, right there, see? This is usually what people do this line is a bad idea. What are we doing over here? And this is exactly what 99.9% .9 of the people are gonna do. They are going to create a mock web service, which is going to return you some mock data, and then they're gonna pass it into a view model right there, and then you're gonna call whatever, and then you're gonna check that, oh yeah, I just need to verify that the mock service fetch product was called. That's a bad idea. The reason it's a bad idea is this is nothing to do with the test. This is just an implementation detail. If I go ahead into my web service and change the fetch products and make it get products, but the result is exactly the same, then the whole test will fail. Why is the test failing? I mean, it returns you the same exact products. Why is the test failing? It's failing because you are testing the implementation details. Okay, so definitely read that article. The other question is, would you say MV architecture is simpler versus MVVM? Both architectures are fine. You can use MV architecture versus MVVM architecture. I believe that Swift UI is already uh, an architecture or already a pattern. So wrapping it around with some other patterns like MVVM or you know, MVC and Viper and whatever, it will make your life difficult, okay? There will be some cases where I will introduce a view model type of thing. 
uh, if I have a long form, which I don't right now, but let's say if I had a form like this, but with more, more fields, I mean, this only has like two, but if, if I was filling out a form which has like 10 or 20 fields, then I don't want to populate, or I don't want to disturb my uh, view over here. I would probably create a view model and do all of those different things in there, all right? So in those cases, it's fine. But uh, what I have learned is if you create, if you're creating the MVVM, which I have for the last three years, you don't have access to the environment object inside your view model. So you end up passing the environment object as a dependency to the view model. And then that view model passes the environment object down to the children and down to the children and so on. And it becomes a messy situation. And at the end, you don't really remember that, okay, who is keeping track of who is a single source of truth because I'm completely lost now. I have to pass uh, three different layers, right? So I'm not saying MVVM is bad or good. I'm just saying that it will, I think it will not truly allow you to harness the power of Swift UI and it will add needless complexity which you may not need. All right, so that's what I'm saying. But the question like, can you still create an app using MVVM? Absolutely. If you want to use that route, you can use this route. I find this to be a little bit more simpler for me at least. So I use this approach, all right? Um, any other questions? I think that's uh, that's the end of, I think we have already passed our one hour mark. Any other questions that I can uh, answer for maybe in a few minutes and I have to leave? And hope you have enjoyed it. Maybe we'll host it next time and we'll, we'll take this app a little bit further. Right now, this app only has one screen, I guess. Well, two screens, if you count the this one. Uh, but uh, eventually we should be able to go and, uh, you know, go to the detail screen. All right. All right, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, hope you have enjoyed it. And uh, let me actually, if you want to learn a little bit more about it, let me actually go over here. And this is the session. This is the this is my course, and that kind of like talks about the same thing, which is MV design pattern. Uh, the link to the course should be right there in your description, the YouTube description. There should be a link there, so you can use that particular link. All right. All right, and that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for coming. I will, if and you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my name is Adam Sharp on Twitter. So I'll post a link to the GitHub and repo and all that stuff. I don't even know if I have the repo right now, but let me actually double check it uh, because I thought that I already have that repo. Or maybe part of the repo. This might be a little bit more stuff Store model, product model. Uh, okay, so it's a little bit different, I guess. You can use this one. Um, I think it will be not exactly the same code that we did today. It's a little bit more code even. So you can definitely try this one out. There we go. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, I really hope you enjoyed it. We'll meet uh, in the future. Okay, and let me end the stream right now.